So in about 74 minutes, uh, we're gonna have Chris Rasby take over the stream. If you guys have any questions for him, he's gonna be talking about uh, working smart in Unreal 4, covering a number of things. Uh, but I just wanna make sure that you guys know that there's a channel in the Discord where you can ask your questions. So uh, it's just called uh, questions for DinCon in the DinCon Digital category. Any questions yet you, you put in there, we'll um, we'll put them up in queue and then we can ask Chris those questions at the end of his talk. Uh, maybe, Muck, maybe. But uh, yeah, dude, this is actually starting to get somewhere, which is kind of cool. So what I wanted to talk about today before basically just keeping you guys busy <laughs> until Chris gets here is uh, designing for reuse, right? So like what, like how do you build game art in a, like an efficient way when it comes to notes or like, uh, like I'm reading Paul's message when it comes to notebooks. No, when it comes to, uh, uh, you only have a limited amount of time to create the art for a game, right? Uh, let's let's lower this music now and um yeah i just want to make sure everything is working as well during this this segment of the stream so you can you can kind of call us like a pre-show so let's uh let's get this going here all right got my own music going cool okay so when it comes to uh designing for uh reuse it's like, what the heck does that mean, right? Um, it's thinking about like how stuff is constructed, keeping stuff uh, as cheap as possible when it comes to the amount of content you have to make, right? Because when you're when you're in development or even when you're working in your portfolio, there is a certain amount of uh, time that your mind will allocate to this project before you're just like, dude, this is, I'm numb, right? You lose interest. You Yes, yes, Vertex, reduce, reuse, recycle your models. <laughs> it's perfect. So, uh, and I mean, I'm, I think all artists are guilty of that, especially when you're learning how to manage all that stuff. Um, so like, for example, I'm gonna use this scene because it's probably the best example I have on me of like reuse and, and trying to keep prop counts down. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about modularity, we're going to talk about um, powers of three. There's this thing that I, I call object attraction. Um, we'll go into that a little bit as well. Just because it's it helps you. It helps you keep stuff cheap. It, it helps you build scenes faster. Uh, and this will all tie into the stuff that Chris will be talking about as well. Because I imagine he's going to go much deeper into it. I'm talking more of the, the concept behind... Um, optimizing what you're needing to build, not the technical side of it. You just hit me with a DM on Discord about the scene. Um, it's almost like you plan these two sessions, almost Valkyrie. Now the pre-shows are much more relaxed. <laughs> La gasp. Um, and then, Using using these concepts, I want to talk about like, or at least brush over the the idea of what that means for what you're seeing at a distance. What's what's streaming in, and uh, how you can think about the assets that you're you're utilizing at a at a distance as well. Uh, let me kill this here. We'll just pull this down. Uh, maybe I can maybe I can kill that too. Hey. What is this visibility? Okay, so keep in keep in mind about how things are constructed, and then I'm sure most people that are just starting to construct their first scenes are like, "How do you keep that in mind if you've never constructed a scene, right?" And the reality is, is it just comes with time. You have to just kind of put your own self through your paces, like build a scene, um, finish that scene look back and kind of do like, um, so in game development, we have this thing called postmortems, where you go back and you look at what worked really well, what didn't work really well, 
and then you you categorize those the things that work really well you you know pat on the back good job put those to the side and uh then you look at the stuff that didn't work all that well and you try and understand where where it broke down and it's great when it's a team right but when it's just you it could be kind of difficult to uh to note that stuff down i always suggest when you're doing this type of postmortem, whether it be for the game project you're working on or your personal art that you note that down on the side as you're built like oh man this took way longer than i thought it would note that down like building high polys oh that took a while or sculpting i'm really slow at sculpting so like the sculpting segment of said scene took longer noting those things down it's going to be much easier to build your postmortem quickly at the end and then understand what, uh, where you got caught up, what was slow. A lot of the times you're going to know, um, and it's going to be pretty clear to you, but just, just in case it's a good idea to do. Uh, but yeah, so keeping in mind how stuff is constructed and how you can reuse as few assets as possible. Like if we, if we really boil it down, can I get, can I select this guy? Where are we at here? This guy bugs me just floating out here. But uh, let me see if I can find him really fast. Oh, this is how I find stuff in here because I don't know. There we go. Cool. So this this is a really good example. And I've talked about this on stream before. But this this kit, if you want to call it a kit or like a related assets thing. What's up, Foozle? How you doing? Um, this is, these are three pieces, right? That make up, when you go back in here, that make up all of the ivy in here. And like, you can look at this corner and be like, wait, wait how is that put together? And then you can see like all of the reuse that's happening. There's a lot of overlap that can occur in order to achieve this. And it's, it's a matter of like breaking up patterns in order, oh, I picked a great spot to look with the sun. And the, um, Control shift L. We'll just move control L. Just move the sun around here. There we go. So, so we have like all these pieces that I'm using, right? Which is, I think up here is only two meshes, right? And we're just reusing the hell out of them and rotate them. Some of them stick into the wall a little bit. Anywhere that you can kind of break the illusion of the duplicate look is really important. Bit cash. <laughs> yeah, you gotta kit bash that stuff sometimes. Just be aware of how much overlap and mesh you're piling on top of things. So these are more of the smaller details, and this is a I would say is a pretty good example of how you reuse and reconstruct stuff with what you've already made. Uh in other cases, you could technically, uh depending on the engine, you could turn this into its own set group it together and become one i'm really happy with this ivy chase <laughs> and uh it still needs a lot of love but uh yeah so that that kind of goes into another topic that i want to touch on is the powers of three and i don't know if i'm following it all the time in here um but it's it's a really good thing to be following or a rule to kind of be a, trying to apply to yourself and and it's groups of three so if you if you have one prop and you're using it everywhere, right? Like this guy. We'll just bring him out here. So this is a block out mesh. Uh if you have this guy out here and you use him a bunch, you're going to see duplication, right? You're going to see a lot of the same stuff over and over again. And you can negate some of that ooh, by uh rotating some of these and trying to like get away from that. Right, so maybe maybe this one will go this far. So that now you're looking at you can still tell because there's patterns that your eyes are gonna pick up on. Three is definitely the magic number. Um I I apply it to everything as well. As like if you have an asset, try and do three roughness types on your asset. Unless it don't force it if it doesn't make any sense. Like if it's all stone, why would there be three roughness types on it? Maybe if there's moss in the scene, that's a maybe a different roughness value. Maybe there's parts of the rock that are wet, that's a different. Then now you have three. It depends on the scene. But uh, you can see rotating these definitely helps. Rain Man intensifies. Uh, 
rotating this around definitely helps, but you can see the pattern still. And that brings us to some of the other aspects where you can turn, a, if you design a prop to be upside down, for example, you can uh, you can get to a position, wow, I think this thing is just off. No, it's good. My eyes are going crazy. You can now, if you turn these upside down and you have them at varying heights and you can get a lot of reuse and this is just with one one prop, right? But if it comes down to it, that's just not, that's usually not going to be enough. And when you get into really micro propping like this, especially if it's like an open world game, you're going to get into some trouble where essentially you're, you're constantly loading tons of small stuff when you should probably cluster it up just a little bit more. Yeah, I'm like, I gotta, gotta get that roughness variation. Wait, was there a countdown there last week or is that new? No, that was there uh, last week as well for Rusian. So I did make, I made a single one. Where is it at? This guy. And the single one also helps you as like a support. Like if you wanted to put it up here, maybe I want to place one. Let's see if I can. So if you wanted to place one like this, and you rotate it that way. Put another one down here. You can see how instantly you start. Now these all look pretty unique and it only requires you to make two props, right? So keep keep that in mind when, when it comes to like how many assets you need. Um, and I say rules of three because with a third one, you can guarantee that uh, the human eye will have a hard time catching the patterns as long as you're using them in the right way. You could argue that by turning these ones upside down, I'd made a third one. Uh, there's also, you don't have to go upside down. You can build it like this. And then this goes into like what Chris will talk about later with shaders in general. Um, but you can use shaders in order to support the rotations of your assets. That way they're not looking so replicated and of the same. Should the three be similar sizes? That is a really good question, Solar. Um, so that actually that goes into the next point, object attraction, which is something I've, I feel like I've made up. Like I, I used to say it's like prop gravity or like, uh, like if you, if you look at planets and you have a really large planet and then you have a smaller planet that'll orbit around it. And it's like the laws of physics and gravity and whatnot. But I think object attraction is probably a better way to, to say it even though it's not, they're not technically attracted to each other. Like, hello, how are you doing? It's not, you know, they're not dating or anything. Um, so when we look at object attraction, that's like you're going from large scale to small. And should threes be similar sizes? Usually I would say depends, Solar. So if we, if we go in and we grab these, these wall parts, right? So I've got a modular set here, which is these, these wall pieces. And if we dupe this over here, Hey Ben, how you doing? If we dupe this over here, you can see that, uh, they all work together. You've got an inside corner, outside corner. Um, this wall I think is a three meter wall. No, it's five meter. No, this is three meter. The naming is wrong on that. And, uh, then we have like a, a five meter one that's, got a cut corner i think there's one more piece where are you at is it this is it this one i don't think that one's over there let's bring you over there we'll just rotate this slide again so when when you look at these pieces i haven't built these in a way where um i can reuse the the wall pieces very well but I'll, I'll get into that after we talk about this object attraction. So with object attraction, the idea is that you have really large objects. I'm not even snapping these, as you can see, but you have really large objects like these wall pieces, and then you would have uh, medium sized objects and then small objects. Now the power of three or the rules of three, I wouldn't apply things that are, um, are really small to that rule set. So like, for example, you have this wall piece, Actually, it might be better to go in here and look at it from inside of here. So you have 
you have this wall piece and then you have ivy and then some plants some ferns or some uh these like these these green guys <laughs> i don't even know what these are called they're made up in this uh scene and then you have grass flowers and you can so you can see it like it shrinks down here i'm gonna get my we're getting epic pen out it's gonna be easier easier to explain okay so so you have large assets right then you have your your medium assets and then you have your smaller and your smaller and then your your micro and what i usually would suggest is the initial uh pass of taking this object attraction into into your mind and, and understanding it and utilizing it is that you will it'll be best to do your largest piece uh your medium and then your small and then worry about the rest in your like detailing pass so the other thing i want to say nice this is this is so weird um the other thing i want to say is that when you have this this kind of uh when you're thinking about asset attraction uh that or object attraction that you're that it's applying everywhere so if you if you have even a small prop let's say you have this this one we'll we'll scale it up for example reasons you have this this medium sized prop and you put it against a large prop or like a even larger one now you have your your in between right you do have your smaller props that are, would be like this guy here and maybe that goes out here but that the idea is that you you gradient away from the uh, from the larger pieces and shrink them down uh, the the, uh, the nice effect that you get with that as well are these placed yes these are placed cool I can just move these around and kind of get them into position the really nice thing is when it starts boiling down to like optimization and performance is uh I don't have LOD set up on this but uh, the idea is that the larger pieces you should see from further away and the smaller they get the quicker they're going to kind of lower in LODs and then eventually stream out so that you're not seeing them anymore so if you're building with large shapes in mind and then anchor smaller shapes around them and then continue that that trend that that progress as it goes out to no propping or to the open space that is like the ground or whatever it is the road uh, or field that like as you get further away you're only really paying for the elements that really make the biggest visual impact when you're when you're looking at them evening Anik, how you doing uh some other stuff i want to does that is that clear for everyone in chat just before i trying to think of what what the next thing should be i talk about that it's it's really interesting because like a lot of the times when you're building a scene everyone's like oh i gotta get all these really small details in here and the reality is man you, you don't <laughs> you don't you can uh you can paint these down and you know play somewhere you want and the the reality is is you pick your camera angles and then you you frame up to them and you save that camera spot do what chris does dupe the frame so you have your your layout in one shot and then like a working frame in the second shot and then your working frame start propping around the camera get all the the small micro details around the frame and that will imply so much to the human mind that your the viewer will believe the fidelity of the scene just from those angles that's why i say it's so important to pick your camera angles early if if and when possible uh uncomfortable yes these will be uh uploaded to youtube so now that i've i've talked about that i want to talk a little bit about modularity um chris might talk a, a bit more on modularity i just know that uh it's always asked like is it twin stream bumby what's up man <laughs> 
so modularity is a great and super useful tool, right? And when you when used, it, it allows you to build large scenes, which is really enticing to artists, right? You have like this urge to create really, really big scenes. And when when it comes down to uh, when it comes down to it, building a really large scene means you have to make a really large scene. You know what I mean? Like you actually have to finish this really large scene. Uh, so modularity is like the good, the bad, and the ugly, if you want to call it that. Right? You've got you've got this technique to be able to use modular pieces to build very large scenes. And because it's modular, there's this, this craving to make a lot of modular pieces. And you have to be really careful with that. That's, that's kind of like the bad part about modularity. And the, and the fact that there's this impression in the, uh, in the learning community that you should always build modular. I mean, maybe, maybe that is not the case. Um, I just want to make sure that it's very, very clear that modularity is not required in every scene. I think ex like expressing that you know and understand modularity as a concept in the design and you had built to it is really good. So for example, if you take these wall pieces and we put them down here and I'm like, yeah, this is this is like a wall, like a lower, a low wall set. Russell, what's up, man? So let's say this is like a really low wall. Uh, like like a stone fence, if you want to call it that. And uh, it's it's really low. It's Let's say there's none of this is down here. It's like literally this high. This is a great way to show that you understand modularity. And it doesn't require that you build an entire building that way, right? Uh, the problem I wanted to highlight mainly with, with modularity is is that you can quickly spiral out of control when it comes to the amount of content that's going to be required for you to make. So if you're, I've got what, one, two, I think this is a dupe piece right here. So I've got one, two, three, four, five pieces. And then you can see the moment I added this piece here, I had to solve this angle cut on like an open side. So this forces another piece. So if you if you push enough, you can create so many props just to get your modular set functional. When in reality, you don't actually need all that much. Um, a lot of times I'll see modularity in portfolios where they're like, they built a modular set for this building, but the pieces that they made for that modular set are actually just kind of cutting up the building itself. And there's not all that much reuse. So the what I would suggest doing when when you build, like let's say you do a, a building in a in a city, um, I would say it's it's key to have like a set wall piece, let's say five meters wide, and then you're gonna have an inner corner and an outer corner, and now you essentially have everything you need to build a floor, right? Just the outside of a building and the floor. From there, um, using a block out of understanding what you want to build in your scene, then you'll start to understand like, oh, I actually need a door here or a window here. Well, can I just like use this wall piece, right? Dupe this one and then in my DCC package of choice, mine being Blender, uh, I go in and model in a door or, or an opening for a door. And that's my, that's another piece, right? You have to remember that because I added this door, now I have two wall pieces that I need to maintain and finish, right? So then you're like, okay, I need, I need windows. Well, that's another, that's another wall piece, right? Maybe you build the windows into the frame of the, the same modular set as the door. Just keep all of this stuff in mind when you start to build a modular set. And just like, I mean, I think it's really good to look at a picture of a building that you're thinking about modeling and just draw lines on it and understand how you break it down into parts and then how you can like simplify those parts in order to uh, make as few pieces as possible while still being able to achieve that building. That's like the true nature of like 
fighting and understanding modularity. Um, what is my what is my next thing? Uh, the other thing I, I just wanted to talk about is scope. So, and we were getting into it a little bit with this is the scope of your scene gets really crazy when you um, when you start to build all these modular pieces and the scene just gets insane. So when it comes to scope, for example, I built I built out this this back area with a lot of the same parts. If not, I, nah, it was all the all the same parts that's building this area. And the reality is, is like, when am I going to see that? I think the only reason I built that was to show something similar to what I did in stream, uh, what I'm doing in the stream right now. It's just thinking about the uh, the modularity and how few props I needed to actually create something like this. Uh, and yeah, when it comes to scattering on the ground, that also follows that that rule of like uh, object attraction where it falls off and, and kind of bleeds into like an open space. So I think I'm actually going to take a little bit of time here and we'll just build one of those out. And I'll be answering questions in chat while I'm doing that. Um, so if you have any questions, just throw them this way. And don't forget uh, Chris's stream, which is in, what is it, in 48 minutes, is going to be on uh, on Working Smart in Unreal 4. And so if you want to ask him questions, there's a channel in the Discord just for that. Uh, it's, just, it's called uh, Questions for DinCon. I keep forgetting it, so I have to always look to make sure I'm saying it right. But yeah, check check that out and ask any questions you want for Chris, and I'm sure he will get you everything you need. And if not, I mean, the struggle is real until you uh, until you join our community, and then they give you the answers. <laughs> but uh, cool. Okay, I'm going to I'm just going to build this little corner out, which is basically I just use four corners and a wall piece and we're just going to look at all the things you can do when you think about that that gradient effect i wonder if we could get crazy with it maybe we can i mean we got what how long we got we got 47 minutes and the little notes that i had i went through them so fast so uh feel free to uh chime in with a question or you know how are you guys doing this definitely has a Sims character living inside. Oh, in here? Oh man, if I would have looked up and, ooh. So a lot of the times you're gonna be blocking out something like a, a cube here, right? Or a shape that's similar to this, which looks like a cube. And then you would uh, maybe think about how you're framing stuff. Maybe I need this to be like some type of castle wall thing, right? Let's Let's literally make a castle out of Tim's designs. This sounds like a great idea. I'm also gonna group these up, I think. That work? No. Cool. There we go. So I'm just gonna Place these where I think height wise I would like them to go. I wonder if I can do this. And, oh my gosh, yes, I can. Hmm, I'm not gonna do that. Joker, what's up, man? How you doing? Do you also light your scenes at work? Uh, yes and no. It depends on a lot of things. That's a great question. Um, a lot of the times you're blocking out lighting, and then the lighting team will come in with uh, using the same concepts you you were working off of to kind of uh, build on what the concept art and art direction was trying to go for, right? So it can either be temp temporary lighting, which usually you would probably group into its own section. Uh, and then you would go back and the lighting team would go back later and toggle that on and off while they build their lighting to try and understand uh, what 
what you were trying to do and um, ultimately create what the art direction wants, right? Yeah, to group assets is just control G. The downsides, it's not very permanent. Like if I, if I do this, I've got two groups here. If I control G on this one or control shift G and ungroup it, it actually ungroups this as well. So it's very temporary when it comes to that stuff. Uh, keep that in mind, very, very temporary. And I, I couldn't even undo the grouping or the ungrouping. So <laughs> hopefully that's uh, changing soon. Look, see, I can't even, why? Control shift G seems to do it. That's weird. Yeah, you want to do blueprints if you want to be like properly grouping. So, okay, so we got this this wall thing. Let's uh let's look at what we can do. So, another thing with this wall set, I didn't really utilize the back, right? And I actually scaled the UVs down since they weren't really being utilized. Gonna jot those hotkeys down. Nice. Uh, where are we at here? What? Oh, it is rotated. I'm like, what the heck? Okay. So we got this. I'm going to just dupe this over here. And then I'm going to copy and paste it. And then I'm going to scale it and just do like a minus one. And then move it over here. And then we'll have both sides now, technically. <laughs> see, I can't even, I can't group that because I think I already, see, I ungrouped that one now. Why? Not, it's not reliable. Let's, we'll just put it like that. I should just bring these in and combine them all, but. You know. Oh, that gap at the bottom, though. Minus one flips the object. I mean, it doesn't flip the object. It's uh, inverting the, the mesh, you see? And then Unreal just corrects your normal direction. When we're using a prop for someone else, your wall pieces, for example, is it okay for performance if more than 50% of prop is hidden underground? That's a, that's a pretty good question. I mean, if the prop is already loaded to a certain degree, it doesn't matter, but I think it still matters. You want to, you want to have visible as much as possible. I think Bumby in chat is actually a really good person to answer that question being the awesome tech artist that he is. How much prop can you hide under the ground before it's too much? So you can see what I'm doing here is just trying to design some pieces. Oh boy, do I have stories. A lot of us do, man. When it comes to people hiding stuff underground, So when you would have like a, if you were building this giant wall, right? This is actually a really good example of when you would want to build a wall piece that's more than five meters. Let's say, uh, let's say you want a wall piece that's like 10 or 15 in order to cover some distance before getting to the point where uh, needing to use other modular parts, right? Where's my... I'm like, where's my giant wall piece? Is it over there? And I'm just going crazy? We'll, we'll call this uh, Castle Tim. 
And you can see because we're pushing this far enough into the ground, you're not getting the little emissive details. We do have some emissives that I'd actually separated out. I just need to, I just need to find them. There's this one and this one. They aren't very uh, unique in that sense, so it can be a little dangerous. You know, 90 rotation. How much of this asset is underground? Dynasty, yes. This one? Do you think it's a good idea to do a reproduction of a game environment? Because by doing that, you could lose the process of creating your own modular kit and just follow blindly what the environment artists of what of that game could have done. Nice muck. Uh, that's a, that's a great question. I usually would say, and the other thing is you also have to remember, you should be having fun while you're making art like game art and stuff. But I think when it comes to pushing yourself as an artist, um you're only limiting yourself when when you try and recreate the art of existing games uh you can be inspired by it but remember that you will always be compared to it right so like if you if you really want to uh oh that is a really weird mesh thing going on there uh if you really want it to show well you have to do at least as good as the game you know what i mean Everything else would be considered like um, fan art in that sense, which uh, I guess has a bit of a negative tone to it, right? At the same time, remember to have fun too, you know? This is, these are not going to work for the size of the wall that we have here. <laughs> We're going to hide that. A uh, small question, hopefully. Sorry for my spelling, by the way. I have been doing 3D modeling for one month now with a dream of becoming an environment artist one day. I have started to be a bit more secure with my modeling, and I was wondering if you could give me some categories. That could... <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you could give me some categories as topics you think is really important for an environment artist. I mean, honestly, recreation first, like try and build stuff. Like <laughs> Chris, that's so funny, man. Um, I think the best advice I could give to an environment artist is to not try and do everything all at once. Like you build a scene because you want to be an environment artist, but do you know how to build a prop yet? Do you know how to texture? Like I would say, if I had to do a crash course myself, knowing what I know now, and it was it was a crash course that it lasted a year, right? I think in that year, let me let me note this down because I think this is this could be quite interesting. So in in that year, you would have twelve months, right? So 10, 11, 12. So the first, if you're, if you're going to, hello, Moy, how you doing? So if you're, if you're trying to be an environment artist, I would say that first two months or three months is just, thanks, Bumby, <laughs> uh, is modeling. No low polys. No baking, just modeling. This is what I would I would say anyways. This isn't by any means the right way, because there isn't really a, white, a right way. But so the first three months, I would do a lot of modeling. We're talking high poly, just getting an understanding of your 3D package and understanding how to put stuff together and create recreate the shapes that you see in the references that you are finding either online or even better in person. You know, grab electronics and mechanical things and build that stuff. Uh, don't think about texturing. 
no materials, just build it. The next thing I would say, uh, there's not enough months in a year, that's for sure, Paul, is understanding uh, being able to build a cheaper version of that asset, right? It's like, okay, now that you've been able to create this, like, let's say the fire hydrant, the classic fire hydrant, you create this fire hydrant and it looks great, right? It's uh, it's super detailed. You've modeled it all with all the bevels and all the right areas. It's just, it's perfect. How do you make that as cheap as possible, but still look the same without unwrapping and baking, right? So you're working on low poly skills. Maybe let's say, let's say for two months. After you've gotten used to that, I would say UVing for two months and then model uh, baking, baking and understanding baking for two months. And then textures, PBR, and oops. PBR and shaders. So 11 months. <laughs> you being two months straight, hardcore. So this is purely uh, learning in the sense, right? Might as well do three. So when I say you being for two months, it's take all the low poly meshes that you've built and just unwrap them and get used to the idea of how you unwrap the process, packing, all that, all that stuff, all the fundamentals of what, what it means to unwrap and what it means to have like optimized UV space, that stuff. It's not just literally unwrapping for, for two months, but baking for two months, it's like you need to sit there and you need to understand how to how to bake right uvs I, I find quite fun the other thing is you don't have to do these all like back to back you know what i mean here let me see if i can share the i don't think i can how do i do this let's we'll do we'll do that yes hang on here Okay, you're gonna see that. There we go. Okay, so yeah, so I would say like the first three months is just modeling high high poly, just understanding how to control geometry in 3D, right? Then it's low poly, trying to recreate those shapes for two months. UVing for two months. Uh, you could interchange these, so you do low poly skills for a month, then you go to UVing, then back to low polying, and then UVing, then do some bakes. Now the idea is like maybe the stuff that you modeled up here, you would do bakes and, and the low polys and UVs and bakes of those models, right? But you see, I'm telling you, you're not even texturing until the 10th month. So like you can dabble in it, but if you try and absorb all of this all at once, you're mo you're moving so slow and your brain just no does not do a very good job of like absorbing that information. It becomes very difficult to sort and process all of that stuff. And I'm sure you guys can relate when you think about like, man, I have to learn so many things in order to become an environment artist. And I'm telling you to not even make an environment in your first year. <laughs> So, and it, you can see these last three months are, are pretty crammed as well, right? Now, keep in mind, it doesn't have to be that limited. Like you can go in and you can like, you can take a break from UVing and you can just try and block out a scene. Do not try and complete a scene. You will just go crazy. Yeah, you will overload your mind if you try and go all the way full on. Now, the thing is, is some people we'll get modeling really fast. I would love to create a system where like you can be talking to me or another uh, developer 
And then they're like, oh, your, your modeling's good enough already. You, so you skip three months of, of that. And you know what I mean? Or, or like, oh, yeah, okay, you understand low poly. That's fine. UV and you might get faster than in a month. But it's about building that muscle memory and then just pushing through. <laughs> Bumby. <laughs> the system is called the Dynasty Discord. Yeah, that's how that's how you become a tech artist when you like how there should be an easier way to do this, and then you go into the code and it's over. Do you consider high poly meshes easier than making low poly meshes? Yes and no. Yes and no. I'll keep building on this while we while we talk more. See, this is a really good opportunity where the length of this wall just is clearly really repetitive, right? And you're like, meow, uh, uh, that's a uh, gross. Let's uh, let we move all this. Yeah, cool. So what we'll do is we'll actually go in and we'll find that that other wall piece. Let's bring that over here. We'll rotate that. It's the den. What's up, Bronze? How you doing? Then we got 28 minutes until Chris's talk. I'm excited, man. I'm going to bring us down here and we're going to just remove one of these and I'm going to put this one here. That might be enough to break it up. And if not, I mean, you can take portions of the wall and do that, right? Cool. But uh, it, it really depends when it comes to like high poly and low poly being difficult or because if it's like, is it hard surface high poly? What like what type of stuff are we modeling? You know what I mean? If you just need to clean, a, you just need a clean bake. You can get away with dirty, uh, dirty high poly if it's for CGI. See, pink and I, I pink beasts. I think that's something that uh, you discover over time, right? <laughs> Chris, this is the best quote ever. Never spend six minutes doing something by hand when you can spend hours failing to automate it. I mean, you could argue that the best thing about that is you understood and learned so much of the core values of what you were trying to do. The struggle becomes real, right? Ollie, what's up, man? How you doing? We got through my uh, my segment that I wanted to talk about rather quickly, so now I'm just building here, uh, trying to keep you guys entertained until Chris can save me. But uh, in the meantime, we've been answering some pretty interesting questions. Yeah, this is this is looking kind of cool. I wonder if this is actually a better side or opportunity for the glowy bits. One of the other things I think a lot of people do is they'll uh, they'll look at a scene and they'll try and solve like you see I'm I'm doing the emissive on both sides and I'm like okay what does it look like from this side and what but if the camera angle is always going to be from here, don't even, no stress, man. You know, just build it out. It's all good. I'm liking to make these irregular and stuff. Nice. Oh man, you guys are going wild in chat. Oh, 
Okay, so I've got these the big elements out of the way. I've started placing these kind of more medium slash big elements in. And then the next phase I would say is thinking about where you want focal points to be, right? So if, let's say, let me grab these pieces here. Let's dupe these over here just so that we have some extended wall on the corner of the shot. Let's say the angle's here. And you want this, this corner here to be the kind of the focal point, right? It's nice and close. And it's just a matter of like, okay, how do you make that interesting? Uh, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna just press control one and just save that camera angle. And then we'll go back over here and I'll press uh, control two. So I can just go back and forth really quickly when I need to anyways. Let's move some of this stuff over here. Yeah, so a lot of this detail is just gonna be me like trying to fake it till I make it, you know what I mean? You're just getting information in there. Just trying to build something. Hey, look at this. I wonder if you can just do that. We scale it this way. Cause this corner is lower or a little bit higher there. And then we can place, if you hold down V, we can snap on vertices to the pivot. We can use that to kind of ground this, this point here. Not too bad. Yes, Tim is great. Oh, see, I can even possibly, no, it doesn't look like I can. I was like, can I just raise this up? Is it just going to work? And then I, I, I'm going to cheat and go over here. Man, the amount of times people have... Uh... Chris, you ever done this in, in game development? Just go over to someone's area where they built something and just <laughs> dupe it off? I've never done that, ever. Oh, it's kind of weird with the, maybe I can do this. So you can see, I, I noticed it's kind of weird to have the, the Ivy kind of connecting at the same height as this piece. So it's more about like trying to find like a good balance between what's there and, and how it connects and making sure that it doesn't look strangely artificial. Yeah, it's like you do some really intricate work in this part of the game and then like someone just goes over and they're just like marquee select copy paste and then move it over here and then just nudge some things around. <laughs> it's uh, I'd be lying if I said that wasn't common. The other thing I would really suggest being careful about is not scaling your assets more than uh, maybe by like 20%. Because when you start to scale your assets, not only are you starting to screw with your texel density, but you start to get uh, some weird scale issues with the original design. And if the shader wasn't built to handle that type of scaling, you're going to get into some really weird territory where things just don't feel right and you're not sure why. Hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, so we've, we've been doing uh, quite a bit of detailing right here. I think we need to go in and grab this stuff and just kind of not for a second. We'll just go over here. We'll add some really simple stuff. I just jumped out of my body for a second and looked at what I was doing. I'm like literally attempting to Bob Ross my way through this moment in time.
Yeah, the stuff that people usually take are the things that like you or like duplicate and replicate uh, from other people's work are things that you wouldn't normally uh, you wouldn't be like, hey, you took my it's like something like this, this Ivy, right? If I build like a, a pretty good setup for like how it should go around this corner. You made this? I made this. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I think in some cases you could rotate this down. I think we tried this before and it just didn't feel right. Yeah, and it's the direction of the leaves. You could build it in the shader maybe. I bet Chris knows how to do that. Uh, where the leaves, you could change the directional information of like where they're pointing. So the leaves will just still fan out in the same direction. But let's, um, oh, I just tried to paste in position, Chris. No. Yeah, this is a lot of hand propping, and I think when it comes down to it, if there's ways to get away from that, you should find it and take that route. When when the scenes become big enough, and it's just like, man, you're you're burning so much time, like sitting here trying to make something look look right, when you could just be concentrating on the the overall composition. Because the idea as a level artist or an environment artist, you're, what you want to be doing is looking at the big picture and just trying to get that to look, to look nice, right? So see, that's already, I would say, is kind of enough. Ooh, Arusia, that's a great question. What's the best way to apply a 3070 rule for detail through the whole environment? I can usually do it just fine on a single asset. So... A majority of like if you go in here it's pretty detailed right and i think you get a lot of visual rest in your eye from the grass not really casting shadow and all being pretty low in the contrast of the material that is on the grass so for anyone who doesn't know what the 3070 rule is it's uh, i believe it was created by concept artists if not concept artists they took it from somewhere and i learned it from concept artists <laughs> so the 30 70 rule is 70 percent like low frequency uh detail which is like not noisy not busy pretty simple calm to the eye right it's an area for your eye to rest 30 percent uh high frequency or high detail which would be like this is this area right here is high frequency right if i go back here you, you could argue that the amount of details that I'm starting to put on the ground need to be dialed back. That way I can get closer to the 30-70 ratio. <laughs> the 30-70 rule is if the card is in stock and it isn't. <laughs> Chris spent all his luck, man. So we've got, we've got all this detail kind of in now. And... These are like the major, the reason I placed these earlier is because they're such a major component of the way that the terrain uh, blends with the stone or rather the stone with the terrain. If we go in now and maybe like paint on the terrain a little bit, we can think about like, okay, where's, where's that color going to go, right? You're home? Nice. Hello from the other side of the door, Fuzzle. So... Okay, let's uh let's look at uh some landscape painting. Paint and I'm just gonna go in and uh lower that strength there. Let's go down to 150. Whoop. Painting in areas I've never painted before. It's like, what are you what are you doing? Let's start pretty broad. Let's uh Let's go 0.5 on the strength and 300 again. And we'll think about like where colors can be. Maybe we'll put that color there. 
and dirt. Maybe we'll have some dirt out here. More so that green there. Cool. Now the other downside is the ground is quite flat, so we could sculpt that and try to adjust just to make the ground more interesting. You should maybe get started on your presentation thingy. Yeah, do it, Chris. Do it. We'll be here. You got 14 minutes, man. We'll do some quick audio tests with the uh, chat as well, just in case. And I'll let you know, Chris, when, when you're vocally live, so you don't say something you regret. <laughs> uh, I think my following question doesn't really apply to the topic of today's stream, but I would like to know how to be more original when working off of a concept. Um, for example, in my case, I'm not really good at designing from scratch. I feel way more comfortable working from concept. However, being compared being compared isn't really great. What would you be your way to prevent that? Hmm. PowerPoint transitions, King Spud, come on, man. <laughs> uh, so that's, Martin, that's a great question because it's like, it kind of goes into the territory of like, um, what, why do we build from concept to begin with? And uh, what, is, what does that mean? for us as artists, if we're trying to become designers, like a lot of the times I would say we're not going to become designers, right? And if you want to be a designer, I think that's a, that's different. That's a different territory. Not saying that it's not the right way to go. I think eventually most artists will want to start to try and create their own things. I think the thing is, is like, it's better to imitate and replicate from what you see around you and then slowly shift and change and construed and change the way that it looks to something you're, you're into or that you feel is your design. When, when, uh, so for example, I mean, this, this whole thing here, this looks like Tim's stuff, right? It's using a lot of the pieces that, uh, are in his concept, but I've kind of, basically taken uh his concept as a guide to the look and feel right so if you if you can take a concept look at it and go okay these are the shapes these are the size of the bevels that are being used these are the the overall design of what i'm seeing in the concept if you can build something that looks like it fits in that world you've you've successfully designed within that within the template you know what i mean Does that, does that make sense to you, uh, Martin? Let's get some foliage in here before uh, it's Chris time. It's getting close. So here's a really good opportunity to show. Um, It prop attraction, right? So I'm placing these these plants. I'm gonna just we're gonna place them single. There we go. So you have a lot more control. So these guys, let's say I, I place them around like near corners or close to the ivy, right? Maybe you don't want to see that corner. Maybe you want to hide that you didn't do anything there, you know what I mean? This might be too many here. Hold shift, you can remove them. And then of course you're gonna want maybe one or two out here just for the, the logic's sake. And you can see this piece of the ground is quite high up. Maybe we put some plants up here, 
right? Get that one outlier. Maybe we, we put some uh, this way. Then maybe there's some over here. You can see it's like now you've created a rule, a rule set that the that the viewers can kind of follow and be like, oh, that yeah, that makes sense. And this makes the more things that make sense, the better uh, your scene will be believable or just be cohesive. Um, so if we turn that off and now we go to these guys, these guys are a little bit smaller. And I think the rule for these is to make sure that they cluster around each other. And you use them around the outside areas around the uh, these other plants. Right? So you can see it's like I'm, I'm kind of trying to stick around the outside of them. So there's a little bit of logic going in. That's good. Uh, these guys don't really have a logic to them other than I like to kind of treat them like flowers. So you just have a patch every once in a while. Right? Maybe not in the mud. And then you always want to go back here and just see where you're at. And then let's go and let's make some grass. So let's just paint, let's paint the grass in. So grass is going to help us a lot. As long as it's matching the, uh, the ground color, it looks like we're off a little bit here. I wonder if there's a mismatch in the, uh, RVT. It looks like it. Yeah, because it's more accurate over here. Oh, that's interesting. I've never gone this far away. Looks like it becomes more inaccurate way over here. Yeah, I see it's there's a mismatch going on. It's probably the volume. Either way, painting this stuff down does wonders for describing a space. If I can. Nope, it does not look like it. Okay, we're going to default to landscape. Let's go paint and we'll just do regular. Ah, uh, yeah, no, it's not updating. Hmm. Yeah, or it's completely, <laughs> it's completely wrong in this area. Okay. It's going to remove that. Remove this. Yeah, we're getting. We're getting mismatch. Either way, try a recapture. That might do it. Uh, let's let's do this real fast here and just. Um, I think you might be right because there was a moment where it popped where I think it was like, "Hey, this doesn't. Uh, we've never painted in this sector before." Bt. Oh, right. I need to be in the right. Set bounds. There we go. There we go. Yes, the bounds weren't correct. Okay, so now we're getting good blending. <laughs>